Hey, it's Mike here, and today, Egyptians were fat because of carbs? Well, that is what YouTuber What I've Learned recently told his 1.5 million subscribers in a video. What was making the ancient Egyptians fat? Well, this whole fat pharaohs becoming massive mummies in their pudgy pyramids idea was news to me. I'm sorry. So I went and did a bunch of research to figure out if there was any truth behind this. So we're gonna apply that research. And there are some just basic facts of Egypt that pretty eloquently debunk his claims hard. So from meat mummies to mummies with man boobs, as what I've learned says, we're gonna cover it all. So let's just go. If you recall, I did respond to what I've learned in the past, in particular to his defense of processed meats in a video, which is quite peculiar, but since then he seems to have gone even further down the low carb rabbit hole, really gulping up the low carb narrative, hook, line, and sinker. And much of the video is what I've learned making pro-saturated fat, pro-cholesterol points. And we'll cover some of that in the end, but mainly we're going for Egypt here because it's a 30 minute video. Let's just get into Egypt. He starts the video by showcasing a few figures in Egyptian history that were overweight or had some issues. He starts with architect Hemi Unu, who he says has man boobs. Here he is. The architect Hemi Unu's statue suggests that he was overweight with a serious case of man boobs. I actually stumbled upon a discussion about this exact Hemi Yunus statue by researchers on researchgate.com, one of which was Teresa Moore, Egyptologist at UC Berkeley, who said, quote, senior officials were sometimes portrayed with extra rolls of fat, showing that they were successful, had access to plenty of food, and did not have to engage in physical labor. She says they may have added some extra weight to some of these officials as a marker of their eminence, not necessarily reflecting their real appearance. So man boobs may have been a little culturally different than they are today. They may have been prized or perhaps even exaggerated on certain statues. And simply put, people of higher status would have higher access to high calorie foods or more calories. I mean, gout is called the king's disease for a reason. We have these diseases of affluence that we've known for a while. And one of those is heart disease that he covers saying that a lot of mummies from Egypt have atherosclerosis. And yes, this is true. It was found as early as 1911 that Egyptian mummies had heart disease. From this Lancet study, yeah, mummies from Egypt have a reasonably high rate of atherosclerosis, about 38%, which is lower though than the low carb dream diet of the Unangin hunters, which is essentially an Inuit slash Eskimo diet who had a 60% rate. Again, this is probably a result of an affluent diet to another Lancet paper. These researchers say, yeah, atherosclerosis has been identified in mummies, but it seems to have been fairly uncommon in ancient Egypt and the population in general, and this difference is probably due to the affluent elite's diet. Now, the people who are mummified were not the weavers and the farmers, and he does actually make a point that there is no difference between these classes, and we're gonna refute that also, but before that, he gets into some other high-ranking people in Egypt that appear to be not so physically fit. National Geographic reported that King Tut had large deposits of fat on his hips and breast-like fat clumps on his chest. Yes, put that banana that's in your hand down right now because King Tut may have also had man boobs and some wide hips. It appears he was completely feminized by eating whole grains. But was King Tut even fat or maybe obese by US standards? Well, there were 2000 CT scans that were done of his body in a sort of virtual autopsy. And as a result, they did a depiction of his body. And as you can see, he has a bit of a feminine figure, but this is where it gets complicated. And that is that he was inbred. His parents were siblings. He had many problems. He had like a crooked foot and an overbite. And there was probably some type of estrogenic issue going on there that affected his fat deposits. So Tut was not massive. He was not dummy thick. Maybe, maybe you could call him slim thick. <laughs> but it will all be thrown out the window with a major point about King Tut that is gonna come later on in this video. But I just have to say, is there maybe another leader that we know of that loves to eat meat that is just way further in the direction that what I've learned is criticizing Tut for? Just saying. And the final example he uses is Hatshepsut, who was actually the second female pharaoh in Egyptian history, who was, yeah, clearly overweight and probably diabetic. And the mummy of Hatshepsut was very fat and probably had diabetes. And I don't even feel a need to debunk that there may have been a handful of fat Egyptian royals. What I'm concerned about is the greater population of say Memphis, the largest Egyptian city with 250,000 people, were they fat from carbs? Now we have a trove of ancient Egyptian art showing that the population was not only 
not white like the U.S. school system made me and probably you believe if you're from here, they were also not overweight. This is a population that is depicted in virtually all cases being slim and fit, and they were eating a variety of whole grains and legumes. They were eating whole wheat, they were eating barley, they were eating lentils and beans, and they were eating fruits like figs. This is basically the Mediterranean diet. You have to look really hard to find even slightly chubby depictions like the ones that what I've learned puts forth. And pointing to a few overweight individuals is logically akin to going to Japan, pointing to a sumo wrestler, and just saying all of Japan is fat. This is just so, ah. But he does actually get into some science, and he mentions some isotope studies that are highlighted by a low-carb doctor, Dr. Eads. He says that they only ate 29 to 19% of their protein from animal protein. Interesting sounding statistic. Dr. Eads explains that this kind of stable isotope analysis found that the Egyptians got only 29 to 19% of their protein from animal sources. I've called out what I've learned in the past for making blatant errors that always seem to exaggerate his position in this case. I don't know if he just made a simple mistake or he didn't know what the plus or minus sign is, but it's 29 plus or minus 19%. The higher percentage point is never listed first. And to cite the researchers that Eads was citing, yeah, they can only really say that less than 50% of dietary protein came from animals. And they elaborate saying that, yeah, it was probably closer to 30%. So what I've learned got his numbers wrong, but he does say they appear to be roughly equivalent to vegetarians. The study says modern vegetarians, which as we know, eat a ton of animal fat. They eat eggs and they eat dairy. These things drive out atherosclerosis, and we'll talk about saturated fat at the end. But this is where things get particularly bothersome. To make the case that carbs are making all of Egypt fat, you have to paint Egypt as having a single diet, that there's no difference between what the royal people were eating and what the common folk were eating. And so he goes on to say that according to a study based off the isotopes, it doesn't look like people of different classes were eating different amounts of animal protein. And as this paper explains, there was a surprising lack of difference in the stable isotope composition between social classes. Here's a study and here's the quote. And if you didn't know better, you might think, yeah, maybe they were all eating the same diet, but there's several problems with this. First of all, the remains that they looked at for this study were not up by Cairo where Memphis was, where all of the people lived. This was down at two smaller river cities that maybe had 10 to 20,000 people. It's likely that the differences in diet weren't huge there between classes compared to perhaps what they were for pharaohs and the general population of the largest Egyptian city. And the study itself, when talking about estimating animal to plant protein even says, quote, it is difficult to draw conclusions about human diet on the basis of nitrogen isotopic abundances. I think it's very likely that just like pretty much all aristocracies throughout the human population, they were eating more animal protein and animal fat than the average population was in Egypt. And I think a great point to illustrate that goes back to King Tut, who was probably feminized by carbs. Well, it turns out that he was buried alongside 48 cases of meat. Tutankhamun, who died in 1323 BC, was buried along with 48 wooden carved cases containing poultry and beef. Yeah, whole wheat causes man boobs, though. What I've learned, go home. You need more carbs. Yes, a lot of these pharaohs and mummies in general were buried alongside literal meat mummies. This meat was put there to help them have sustenance in the afterlife. And so it turns out that probably all of these mummies that he mentioned, all these individuals that he mentioned at least, were probably pounding down animal fat. Despite the troves of meat that King Tut was set to rest alongside, uh, what I've learned concludes that, meaning that everyone, rich or poor, was generally eating a high carb, low saturated fat diet. A high carb, low saturated fat diet. I want to go back to that Lancet paper for a second, and I apologize for the long quote, but this is this is pretty key. Quote, interpretation of the hieroglyphs indicate that the diet consisted mainly of beef, wild fowl, bread, fruit, vegetables, cake, wine, and beer. Many of these food items would obviously have contributed to an intake of saturated fat. They say they ate things like goose, which are super high fat, 20% saturated fat. And that's, of course, the classic low-carb, carb-fear mistake of pointing to foods that are actually high fat and saying those are high carb. We're talking like tortilla and potato chips and donuts, which are all 40 to 60% fat. And regardless of what your view is on animal protein ratios, 
Animal fat is actually different, and guess what? Egyptians, ancient ones, had butter from the Lancet again, even that the bread that they consumed was enriched with fat, milk, and eggs. The cakes were typically made with animal fat or oil, and they say, well, it's difficult to calculate. It is still evident from a conservative estimate that the dietary energy was more than 50% from fat, with a significant portion of this coming from saturated fat. Ouch. But I do want to mention that Eads does criticize this exact paper in his presentation, which very clearly is just what, what I've learned copy and pasted in terms of all of his Egyptian points. Either way, he says the paper demonstrates the rank stupidity of people. And this is a paper that I love to hate because it just shows the rank stupidity of a lot of people. Well, it turns out that that paper was written by an Egyptologist and a doctor with just a bit of heart expertise, as this list shows. And Eads didn't even have any real points directly debunking that study. He just kind of scoffed at it as the audience laughed. Anyway, moving on to whole carbs, because yes, what I've learned criticizes whole carbs in his video. It's worth noting that the Egyptian population ate whole wheat bread, and they also ate legumes, which, as this study found was the number one dietary predictor of elderly survival. So yeah, those are health foods. And this meta-analysis on whole grains and mortality found an inverse association with whole grain intake in total and cause specific mortality. And the findings were particularly strong and robust for cardiovascular disease mortality. And we're talking 16% lower total mortality risk with higher whole grain consumption. And from this study, whole grains were inversely associated with artery stiffness, Sorry, uh, it wasn't whole wheat that clogged the arteries of those mummies. And for a third study on this, this randomized crossover trial put Danish people on whole grains and they lost weight and their inflammation markers went down. And I know that low carb people still think that inflammation is a good marker for heart disease, even though they completely deny cholesterol. And I wanna move on to modern populations here because we can simply speculate about some fat monarchs in the Egyptian period and the population thousands of years ago, or we can just look at studies on carbs and weight and carbs and outcomes now. Now, how about a group that eats more carbs than the average population, the vegans? You know, how about diabetes, which that female pharaoh had? Well, it turns out that from this study, vegans had 78% lower total risk of all diabetes. Vegans like me must be obese because of all the carbs. Well, again, to Adventist populations. In terms of the US, they were the only diet group that averaged a normal BMI. All other diet groups were overweight, including the vegetarians. And don't even get me started on Asian populations that eat a very high carb diet and their BMIs. Instead, I wanna move on to low Low carb diets, which are massively being touted throughout all 30 minutes of this video, and I'm not gonna cover all of the points there. Instead, let's just go straight to the mortality research. From this meta-analysis, we're talking about a 30% increased risk of all-cause mortality for people who are on low-carb diets. And a new one that I've never mentioned before, this meta-analysis from 2019 that looked at high versus low-carb consumption to get an idea of low-carb diet risk. And compared to the high-carb group, the low-carb group had, again, a 32% increased risk of all mortality. In addition, they had about a 50% increased risk of heart disease and stroke mortality and a 35% increased risk of cancer mortality. Imagine if vegan studies came out with these results. A vegan diet would just be done for, yet people still tout this low-carb nonsense. And what's worse, is for that high carb group, they didn't even tease out refined carbs. That is conflating all carbs together and they still found that result. And I don't even support refined carbs. I'm about whole carbs. And I briefly just wanna to speak to the middle massive chunk of his video where he spends time debunking the diet heart hypothesis and Ansel Keys, where increased cholesterol equals increased heart disease. I've talked about this so much in other videos going into you know the seven country studies and how they try and debunk that but fail. And in addition, he says there are several studies showing that saturated fat doesn't increase heart disease. Those are, in general, funded by the dairy industry. Here's an example of that. They like to paint this picture that the science is shifting, saying no, saturated fat is fine. Well, it just so happens to be that the UK Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition did a 47-study meta-analysis in 2019, concluding that, yeah, higher saturated fat consumption is linked to raised blood cholesterol, and higher intakes of saturated fat are associated with increased risk of heart disease. 
and that you should swap out saturated for unsaturated fat. And from this meta-analysis on 395 controlled feeding trials, which these people never addressed, saturated fat increased cholesterol. And another very interesting point, people with genetically lower LDL or bad cholesterol have lower heart disease mortality. This is a mechanistic causal relationship, causally linked as is echoed by the European Society of Cardiology. In conclusion, I probably just could have had a 30 second video saying 48 crates of meat over and over again, these mummies and these high-ranking individuals that he points to were probably pounding down the animal fat and looking to the general high-carb population of Egypt. We're talking cities of 250,000 people. Slim. They are slim, fit people just like other high-carb populations around the world. It is simply not the case by any stretch of the imagination that the highest tiers of mummified royalty were eating the exact same things as the slaves and the farmers and the other common folk of ancient Egypt. I hope that you can see that. Unfortunately, what I've learned really just copy and pasted the Egyptian part of Eid's presentation without critically thinking or doing his own research, you know, getting basic figures wrong and not looking at the bigger picture at all. Finally, I don't really care about how many carbs people eat. I just don't want people to use factually incorrect information or misleading points on science to then funnel people into a low carb, high meat, high animal diet that is gonna lead to increased risk of mortality for them. That's pretty much a certain based off the studies and kill a lot more animals, which I do not approve of. Furthermore, I really don't want people to become afraid of carbs, especially whole carbs, which are going to lead to better health states across the board, according to the research. So in conclusion, no, King Tut did not get man boobs from eating carbs. 48 crates of meat is all I should have to say. All right, let me know down below what you think about this video, what you think of what I've learned's argument for the Egyptians. Of course, feel free to like and subscribe, do all that good stuff. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.